I should start with a, with a, a big confession. Um, I'm a complete imposter in this panel. Um, I'm not a network theorist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm a development economist. Uh, my relationship with networks is that um, I kind of like the cool pictures these guys have. Uh, I will show you no cool pictures. So for those of you who have had a serious neural stimuli, uh, this is the time you can close your eyes and rest and relax and just hear the words. Um, my relationship with networks is mostly as, as a functional user. Um, I, I find them intriguing and fascinating, but I really am obsessed with development questions and I want to see whether I can use these ideas for things I, I, I care much more about. Um, the second two reasons I think I'm on this panel is I also illustrate by my very presence over here why networks are important. So I, I, I'm not that important hub Laszlo was showing, but I'm sure as heck pretty close to an important hub. Uh, so I figure that gets me in. And the other thing I think is, um, so, so Ricardo mentioned um, EFL as an idea that I worked with Bailey on. Um, the idea I wanted to talk about today is an idea we came up sort of contemporaneously, or I came up on this idea, but it has a very different trajectory from EFL. Uh, EFL's trajectory is a trajectory of, of uh, substantial success so far. Uh, I should actually thank Maura. We're, we're about to expand thanks to USAID in, in the Middle East as well. So we're really spreading somewhat virally across the globe. Um, the idea I'm talking about today is something I cared about as much or still care about as much, but it hasn't spread. And my, 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 my kind of interpretation of that is, is the, the weakness of the network that I had in that versus the weakness of the network I had, uh, many of whom are sitting here in, in EFL. And so this is also a plea to say, if people care about some of these things I'm talking about today, do let me know, because uh, I, I need a network to connect to over here. Uh, so, so let me tell you a bit about what I care about on this thing. So, so, so every time a disaster hits, I get pretty upset, partly because um, um, you know, there, there is a way to really deal with disasters much more effectively than I think we are dealing with them. I just give you a few pictures of some disasters uh, that have hit in the past decade or so. Uh, these are all, I, I listed big ones. Uh, these are disasters which have like 80,000, 80, 100,000, 150,000 people dead. Um, and if you think about the problems, I, I kind of uh, conceptually think about these problems. You know, the real problem with a lot of disasters is we simply just don't get there. They're too quick. They hit too rapidly, right? Uh, it's, it's often just a timing issue. And you know, you could, you could literally count number of, of people's lives you could have saved had you got there an hour earlier, half an hour earlier, even sometimes a few minutes earlier. I mean, that's the nature of, of, the, of the beast. Um, and the reason it's really hard to respond effectively to these things is it's, it's a whole bunch of these factors. There's information. You really need to know where to go, what to take, who to help. Uh, there's coordination. There are multiple players involved in these things. You need to figure out how to coordinate amongst those players. Um, there's also... Uh, surprisingly, you might say, well, why should you worry about this at this stage, particularly in disaster relief? But I actually firmly believe that accountability is very important, not just afterwards as an afterthought, but actually during disaster relief. Uh, disaster to me, and when I've studied, I've studied lots of development aid, and development aid is a murky world in general, and you kind of think lots of leakages happen. Disaster relief to me is one of the worst possible murkiness spaces, because um, our, moral, our high moral ground in disaster relief crowds lots of incompetence. Uh, people say, well, why are you asking us at this time? We're saving lives. You shouldn't be asking us about efficient usage of money. I actually think it's the opposite. That's precisely when you should be asking people about efficient use of money. Because if you use it inefficiently, unlike other development projects where you didn't build a school on time, so a few kids didn't learn enough on time, you just managed to kill a few people because you got aid in the wrong place and you weren't accountable for what you were doing. So I feel fairly strongly, as you might imagine, about these things. Also, all of this has to be done in real time. Right? Everything has to be done instantaneously. You can't wait around for these things. So for me, this became, when I started thinking about this problem, it seemed like an obvious place where, gosh, the usual models won't work and how to deal with this. So I'll tell you a bit about what I mean by that. Uh, this is the traditional view of disaster management. This is what we did in the US in Katrina. The traditional view of disaster management, I think, treats disaster management like we treat fires. Right? We, we have a fire brigade in each city. Uh, they're well-trained firemen, they're, we love them, they do great work, and whenever a fire happens, we have a standard response of how to deal with a fire. It's a centralized hierarchy of how to deal with a fire, right? We get informed, someone calls, the fire brigade in the local area is informed, they go out, and so on and so forth. That's kind of how we view disaster relief as well. This was FEMA-style response as well. It's very centralized. 
There's very little coordination because the notion is you don't need to coordinate because we have this whole structure which will deal with it. Um, information is fairly limited in terms of, it's all need to know. It's a very, it's like imagine you're working for some like security agency or something. Um, uh, and like I said, there's no accountability. And the aggregation is very high level. You know, what we're told is kind of very broad level statistics. Um, this is all a recipe for disaster because the problem with, uh, I'm punning, a uh, uh, problem with disasters is it's not like one fire. It's like every other house is on fire. And when every other house is on fire, you simply can't do this. You simply can't rely on these. These things just completely break down, right? Um, instead, uh, and there are also myths about disasters. People say, well, centralized response is enough. A few book players are all you need. But this is really, when you look at how disaster relief happens, often it happens a lot of disaster relief, especially immediately, is done by your neighbors. It's done by individuals who have no like, formal role in this space. It's a very different world. Um, there is no time to plan, to coordinate, to, to, to do these elaborate sort of uh, 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 you know, conversations of where to go. Uh, communication often takes, uh, uh, will take time. People say this, right? They'll say, you know, we can't really get everyone on board because we just have to go. Uh, but these are all assumptions I think we rely on a particular world way of doing things, right? In a particular old technology where all of these attributes, all of these actions take time. Also, there's a belief in disaster relief in a very bizarre way that the world is a flat plane. That somehow, as long as we do stuff, everyone will get stuff. And that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. The world is not a flat plane. When you randomly throw stuff, you don't it doesn't get to everyone. It only gets to places. I mean, in Laszlo's world, it only gets to like important hubs uh, or in, in a geographical space, uh, attractors uh, in that space, which could be urban areas, which could be closed by areas, areas next to, to, to good road networks. Um, also, I find it really interesting. We're really sophisticated in using technology and predicting disasters. Like every other second, you'll be told, and now Hurricane Susan is, you know, X minutes away from hitting you. and. Yet when we talk about when disaster hits, it's as if we're in this primitive world of, oh no, we have to coordinate by the central agency. Uh, it's, it's a very sharp contradiction, at least for me as an outsider, uh, looking at him. So are there, are there solutions? So something I worked on so several years ago, um, kind of tried to do this. And this is that idea that I said would kind of, uh, to me, had, had, had a potentially interesting implications, and, and, but it hasn't really taken off in any significant way. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, this was a, a, a thing we set up through a network of a whole bunch of people to respond to a particular earthquake uh, in 2005, eventually killed 70,000 to 80,000 people. Um, um, let, me, uh, let me tell you what the, thi what, the, what the structure was to give you a sense of the kind of power of this network that it set up and the possibilities uh, of, of the network. So the idea was simple. The idea was that in this event, uh, there was a lot of asymmetric information. There was a lot of uncertainty about what was going on. The first few news as people got about the event was a building in the capital city has fallen. Maybe 15 to 20 people might have died. This is, this is literally like the, the day of the event a few hours later. It turned out that the entire northern areas of the, of the, of the country were decimated. But you didn't know because everything had shut down. I mean, think of the, the communication nodes we we're talking about. Uh, it, the, the time it took people to sort of, at least for the government to find this information out, we'd wasted about a day or two days. I mean, literally, I think it was by day three when there was a plea made to the international world to say, can you send like helicopters and, and so on and so forth. So what we did was we thought, why don't you, instead of doing this, rely on just masses of individuals? You know, hundreds and thousands of people were helping at this stage. So if there was a way you could get these guys to coordinate and communicate with each other. And the obvious way is you set up a portal where everyone can kind of come in uh, uh, and interface with each other. And this is kind of a portal where the essence of the idea was you can have hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, coordinate relief effort with each other without ever having to talk to each other. Right? You don't need a central mediator. You simply have an area where you go and submit information and you retrieve information and the information is constantly updated. So if you wanted to go today and figure out, I have a, uh, 500 trucks of XYZ thing I can take to an area, you could be told which is the area as of today, as of this time, is in the biggest need. You basically submit where you're going, the site gets updated, and you're told where to go next. So the next guy who shows up goes to the next area, right? Um, 
Uh, we can also, we started giving maps on these areas. So you could do very quick estimates on these are like epicenter of the earthquake. You could overlay this with various things such as population densities or access to medical services. And you started having, cell phones came up really rapidly in this area. So you could easily have people, and we started having this, submitting information about we have you know, 500 hungry X things, or we have a whole bunch of people who are suffering from Y, or we've got a need for prosthetics, can you please bring that over? Or we need tents, can you please bring those over? So, so the information ability, and we started collecting data in real time for a whole bunch of things, like how many doctors do you even have? Uh, what kind of things do you need? So do you need tents? This is data emerging from people. So you could overlay all of this data on the map in real time and started providing people uh, information. Um, but uh, let me sort of uh, keep going through. You could also do, it was very interesting for us, you could do accountability in real time. So we started getting information from people about who was bringing stuff for them, right? Uh, and so literally within minutes or within hours or within days, you could figure out where were people reaching. So if you were, a lot of people at this stage were saying, well, who should I give money to? Who's an effective organization at this time? And you could start figuring out, uh, this was a graph. Uh, in this case, the army was the biggest uh, supporter. But there were lots of, these are all NGOs. So you can imagine how decentralized this response is. These are all non-state actors. Several of them were actually organizations which had fairly dubious backgrounds. So uh, the State Department of the US wasn't pleased. Uh, I think one of these was a terrorist organization or supposedly a terrorist organization. Uh, but you can imagine you start getting very instant feedback on who's doing what. Um, there are a couple of efforts, though. You Shahidi is an example like this. Um, there, there have been uh, portals which are doing this. Um, I'm, one of the kind of challenges in all these portals is they, they're really nice in the sense that they have great information, great graphics, but it's very difficult for you to extract or provide information on it. These are not meant as, as data portals. It's not easy for you to go to a portal and say, tell me exactly what to take and where to take, which is kind of what you need in disaster relief. You don't need, uh, it's very difficult to digitize a lot of the information, particularly when it's in, in text form. Uh, but, but they're great efforts kind of happening. So, so the, the kind of, the vision that uh, we had at this point, which still hasn't quite happened, uh, is, is a vision where you'd imagine that you can set up basically a, a, a global, this is just a fixed time, a one fixed, a one time fixed cost, which you set up a global map where literally, and we're very close to this, most of the countries in the world, uh, including developing countries, are now essentially digitized. We have digitized censuses of these countries. So it's very easy to take the globe and put it on a digital database which overlays with multiple layers of things like population densities, housing structures, road access, public facilities, medical facilities. And if you have this pre-existing structure, it's trivial that when a disaster hits anywhere, you simply turn that part of the world on. Like, it's not, you, have, you don't have to wait uh, for hours or days. Literally, within seconds of an event, you turn on this structure. And not only do you turn on this structure, you have a portal where basically, so by the way, when you can turn on this structure, you can make very quick predictions very easily. Like this idea that we're living in, that it takes a while to figure out how many people are affected. You can actually make very accurate predictions of casualties within an earthquake from distance, epicenter, and population densities, which will tell you not just how many people will be affected, but what their ages are, what their genders are, what their socioeconomic situation is. So you can get a very, very decent prediction. Uh, um, and then you can help coordinate relief. That kind of was the, was the idea. But all of this is only possible, this comes back to kind of the beginning of why the network is important, is all of this happens in a very decentralized, uncoordinated, often the information is redundant in the way that some of these nodes in a network is redundant, but that's great. That's what gives this structure amazing resilience, amazing ability. In fact, it's kind of ideal in disasters because disasters may not be uh, the concern that, that Laszlo pointed out. Disasters often don't target the big nodes. They often hit sporadically in various places. So, so a lot of this network structure actually survives, the communication structure survives despite these events, and you can really uh, begin to leverage that. Um, and these things are not going away anywhere, by the way. As, as we're going further and further, disasters are hitting increasingly. It's not that we have more disasters than we did before, it's just that populations are moving to more and more disaster-prone areas just because of sheer expansion. And so these events are gonna keep happening, and, and, and the idea we have is if we can leverage kind of the network's power that we have to, to build structures which can really uh, leverage relief, not just in the, in the short run, but also kind of in the medium to, to, to long run. Great, thanks.